Good evening, everybody. It's great to see everyone in church tonight. That was not a rousing response, but I trust that uh, the sentiment is mutual. It really is good to see you, and welcome to all of our first-time guests. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Let's go ahead and give them another hand. To everyone viewing via live stream, thank you as well. Um, for being a part of our service tonight, and I just have to just, just get this off my chest real quick. I'm just so happy Golden State won. Okay. And so um, I just had to get that joy out. <laughs> anyway, uh, we are completing our study on David tonight. It's been a great, great study. I trust that you have uh, been attending every Wednesday, and if you missed it, any one of them, please uh, go to the bookstore or go on to our On Demand online and just listen to the messages because all of them are rich and filled with great, great information that is transformative and can be transformative in our lives as we listen to it and seek to apply it. I'm just going to close out tonight on this character study of David and really talk about some things pertaining to David's character and bring out something about David's life that really just kind of has always stood out to me in, in, in such a, a large contrast, not so much in comparison to everything about David's life because he has some great, great, great qualities, but this one just, for whatever reason, just seems to resonate a lot with my own personal heart, and so I want to share with you. So go ahead and uh, turn with me in your Bible, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 18, and... As you're turning there, um, we're going to pray in just a moment. But before we pray, a little friend of mine named Cece uh, shared this particular joke. And I want to share it with you just to kind of get us ready for the word tonight. This probably actually has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to share it anyway. So here it goes. Why can't you play poker in the jungle? Because there's too many cheetahs. <laughs> you got to love that joke. I can't take any credit from that. That's from CC. Anyway, let's go ahead and pray right now and prepare our hearts before the Lord. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your house tonight. Thank you that you love us and that you care for us and you love us so much, Father, that you just will not leave us exactly as we are, but you want to bring us to a new level of faith, a new level of glory, a new level of strength. We ask you tonight by your spirit to speak to our hearts and transform our lives. Father, give me utterance in the Holy Spirit that I might open up my mouth and speak boldly as I ought to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see a story there that is pretty much world-renowned as it relates to David, the small shepherd boy, defeating Goliath, the huge Philistine giant and champion. And that particular story is not only known amongst Christians, but people just in the world seem to have somewhat of an awareness of the story, even though they may not know all the details. They just know that somebody who wasn't supposed to win won a battle against a foe who was supposed to win, but they ended up losing. So David wins that day for Israel, wins the battle, delivers them from um, becoming slaves to the Philistines, uh, saves their land from being taken over and seized by the Philistines, and in that that day, David went from being just a normal, regular shepherd boy to becoming, in one day, pretty much a national hero. And David was a young man. It wasn't like he was a grown man. He wasn't someone who had been trained to be a warrior. But he did win the day because of God's help and God's power. So when we look at David's life and the fact that he went from kind of, if I can say it like this, from being somewhat of a zero to a hero, what does life look like after that particular day for David? 
And that's where we want to begin to read here in 1 Samuel chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. We'll read a nice stretch of scripture here. So let's just stay focused and stay tuned here and read what God's word says. Verse 1, now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul. Let me just pause for a second right there. The distressing spirit did not come from God, but God's presence had been lifted off of Saul, and the distressing spirit came because of that particular uh, sequence. Now we can continue reading. And he prophesied inside the house. So David played the music with his hand as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast a spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Therefore when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. So after David defeats Goliath, this nine foot tall giant, these are some of the occurrences right after that great, great victory. Not only for him personally, but for the nation at large, which kind of really thrust him into a sense of the national spotlight and national prominence. So after David does, has his great victory, Saul doesn't want him to go home now. I want you to come live with me. I want you to come and stay with me now. Not only that, Jonathan, Saul's son, who was heir to his throne, begins to give David these different elements that belong to him. His robe, his sword, his armor, um, his belt, his bow, and what he was doing or saying by doing this was actually, you are going to be the successor to my father's throne. So Jonathan, David's son, was admitting that openly that David was going to take his father's place, although it was rightfully his throne to sit on because he was Saul's son. Saul goes on and he says David over the men of war, says uh, David over about a thousand different men, and then songs were written about David, where he was the star and Saul was not so much the star, though he was king. Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. And that's what the women were singing, and that was, on the, that was the number one song on the playlist, and that's what everybody was listening to. All over Israel, David was a rock star. Saul was just like a rock. <laughs> Saul was jealous. Because of all this fanfare and notoriety that David had gained, therefore he became jealous of David and tried to kill this young shepherd boy two times. Now, if I'm David, I'm confused because you've elevated me and promoted me. I've done something good, and now all of a sudden you're, you're trying to kill me. That's pretty confusing for any individual. 
But we have to ask ourselves this question. How did David respond to all of this? How did he respond to becoming popular all at once? How did he respond to this immediate success that he had in his life? From being out on the backfield of his father's um, property to all of a sudden now being thrust into national prominence, how would someone his age, so young, respond? Well, the Bible tells us exactly how David responded. The scripture says that David behaved himself wisely. He not only behaved himself wisely as success rushed to his front door, but he behaved himself wisely even when there was a leader in his life who was not acting like a leader in his life. This phrase, behaved himself wisely, appears in verse number 5, appears in verse number 14, appears in verse number 15, which we read all these verses, but also appears in verse number 30 as well. So we have to consider, with the repetition of this particular phrase as it relates to David, this was something that was very pronounced, visible, and noticeable about this young man's life his behavior, and how he behaved himself. It was something that everyone took note of, and make no mistake about it, when you're a shepherd boy with a slingshot and a stone and you kill a nine-foot giant, everybody's eye is on you. And everybody in Israel was watching David because he was a hero. He was, he was an icon all of a sudden, and now David is not allowing what happened in a moment, in a time, one singular event to wrap itself around his head and cause his head to swell. He didn't even approach his king and say, you know what? I don't know why you're treating me this way. You were king. You're taller than all the rest of us. You should have been out there fighting Goliath, but you weren't. You were over there shaking in your boots. What kind of leader are you? I had to come and rescue your bacon, buddy. You should be trying to hire me and pay me huge money. Give me all the cheese in your castle because I earned it. He could have come like that. I was thinking about it. Gosh, if, if that would have happened to a young man like David today, I mean, what, what would he be doing? You know, David's now living in Saul's palace. Maybe somebody would say, hey, I want to invite all my friends over. Well, let's have a party. Let's celebrate. Taking selfies in the palace. <laughs> getting with all the horses and, you know, claiming them as yours. Not only that, this was a great opportunity for David to really put it to his brothers, especially the ones at the war who, you know, were kind of against him being there. Because David got anointed as king by the prophet and right in their home. And he was the youngest, not the eldest, not one of the three who were eligible to go to war. And others were older than him. And David was the youngest. He was the the, the, the runt of the family, and he gets to be anointed king. So you know there probably was some feelings about that, and we saw that expressed in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. But David did not even put it to his brothers as he probably could have. David, if he would have been, you know, in this particular day and time, he might have requested somebody who videotaped him killing Goliath to send him the slow-mo shots of him winding up. Follow the stone, follow it, follow it, follow it. There it goes. Boom! And you see Goliath in frames. Boom, 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 boom. Going all the way down. Boom! Bouncing off the ground. Goes back to David. Boom! And David's just standing there. Like, that's right. <laughs> Israel won. <laughs> Philistines, zero. <laughs> David did none of that. He did not boast. He did not brag. He did not berate the soldiers who were older than him, trained to fight and trained to go to war. He did not berate any of them. The scripture says all he did was behave himself wisely. 
And because he behaved himself in this particular fashion and manner, the scripture says that David was accepted by all. The scripture says all of Israel and Judah loved David because they not only saw in his battle with Goliath, Goliath a gift and a talent and a faith in God, they also saw now something that supports that gift, that talent, that skill to be able to sling a stone and hit someone dead in the center of the head. They saw character. They saw character. They saw him, a boy, acting like a man. They saw maturity in this young man. Whether you know it or not, our behavior is important. It's, it's important because it gives us voice to be able to share God's word and God's truth and our testimony. It, 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 it supplements our voice when there is behavior and conduct that support what we're saying we believe. Several years ago, I was uh, called into jury duty, and I was on a, a case there, and it went like 30 days. I was out of uh, work at that particular time just to be a part of this case. And of course, you know, you have to consider evidence in any case, but you also have to consider the witnesses who get on the stand. And when you're a witness in a case, one of the things that has to become decided is, are you credible? or are you not credible? If you're not credible, we're not gonna believe what you said. If you're credible, we will believe what you said, and then weigh that with the evidence as well. As a follower of Jesus, our behavior does speak to people. Our behavior points to the root of our faith and what we believe and who we believe in. And the more we grow in conformity to the image of Jesus Christ, and the more our behavior reflects his, what it does is it begins to show and mirror Jesus to other people who may not believe in him or know him or ever think about him. We are advertising billboards. We are marketing pop-ups into people's lives of who God is for the sole purpose of making his name famous so that they will thirst for him and want him in their lives as he is in our lives. You may not know BBDO. It's a marketing company. But you will know that's what Campbell's soups are. Mmm, mmm, good. See, their company name isn't to make their name famous. Their company name is to market for someone else and help their product become famous. You might not know who Jack Tinker and partners are, but if you've ever had Alka-Seltzer, you will know, plop, flop, fizz, fizz, talk to me. Oh, what a relief it is. And it's not that you, you don't know the marketing firm, but you know what they created and who the product is that they created that for. And so for us, it's not about us, but our behavior points to someone else. We're marketers for the kingdom of God. We are ambassadors here on planet Earth for the Lord Jesus Christ. And our behavior speaks to this and confirms this. So David behaved himself wisely. What does that mean? I mean, the, the, the Hebrew word is sakal, and it has a very uh, detailed, in-depth definition of it, but I want to break it down for you and try to simplify it just a little bit if I can. So if you're taking notes, to behave wisely simply means this. Number one, to listen. To listen and be able to be instructed. We see this in David's life. He was able to be instructed. Saul would send him out to go to war, and he, take, he took those instructions, and he would go and fight, and he would come back in. David was a 
listener. Number two, it means to look. To look. And you observe what's going on. You not only observe what's going on, but you also observe people as well. Jesus was a great people observer. And as his followers, we can be those who look and observe what's going on and observe people as well. Number three, it means to think. Think. Let your thoughts go through a process. Let your thoughts go through a process. I appreciate people who on the, the drop of a dime can just assess every fact and make a quick decision. That's just, to me, that's just so impressive. Myself, though, I have to let my thoughts kind of marinate. I have to kind of go through a process because it just, it helps me to go to number four, which is to decide. You have to listen, ears. You have to look, eyes. You have to think with your mind, and then you have to decide and come to a conclusion of what you have heard, what you have seen, and what you have thought about and allow yourself to process mentally. Now come to a conclusion and decide. And then fifthly, you have to act, which is the end result, the application of all of these different things. And this is what our dear friend David did on a regular, consistent basis. Now, everyone may not have known this internal process that David was going through, but it was the engine, it was the motor, it was the origin of why he behaved himself like he did. What that looked like, the outworking of it, I should say. So David, after success, and after even being challenged by his leader, behaved himself this way. Do you think that this kind of behavior would attract people? That was a question. <laughs> I think it would. But here's, here's one key thought we have to consider. David did not begin to behave himself wisely because after his great victory over um, Goliath, he sat down with the PR firm and said, okay, wow, I, I didn't even know that was going to happen. You know, I, I was trusting God going into it. I did have some extra stones just in case, you know, but I was trusting God. But wow, did you see that throw? What a throw. That was like my all-time best throw. You know, that was like Michael Jordan's last second jumper uh, against Utah. That was one of those. It was, just, it was just a great, great throw. Wow. What do I do now, guys? What, how should I handle myself? What should I do? Should I get some cards? Should I start, you know, appearing on certain uh, shows in Israel, all around the country? What should I do? He didn't do any of that. He didn't try to become wise the day after victory and even when he was challenged. David was acting wisely prior to which paints for us a very good picture and teaches us a very great lesson that is in the solitary places of our life where we begin to cultivate the proper kind of conduct, character, and behavior. It's not when you're in public in front of people that all of a sudden you begin to shine and try to put on all these airs and try to be something that you're not and try to make people think that you're more holy or more spiritual. It's not about all that, friend. It's when you're by yourself at home alone. It's when you're working in your office and no one else can see you. It's when you're a single parent and you're raising that baby and you feel frustrated at home and you wish you had some help and no one is there to help you, yet all of a sudden you, look, you lift your eyes toward heaven and you say, Lord, can you help me with these babies? And you get strength from God and you keep on pressing and you keep on going. It's not in public that we develop. It's in private. It's in solitude. It's in those indescript moments of time in our life where the Holy Spirit begins to fashion us and teach us and make us more like Jesus. So when these moments do come, 
Like our video announcement, when we are able to step out of the comforts of our own home and go towards our neighbor or go towards a coworker or go towards a family friend whom we haven't seen in a very long time and reach out to them and connect with them regarding our faith. It's in those moments, friend, that what we have been working on with God and he's been working on in us will begin to come out. Take note just for a moment with me. Samuel the prophet came to David's house. Samuel was huge in that day. He was a mouthpiece for God. He was a well-respected, revered man. Scripture even talks about when Samuel was coming, people would get, you know, kind of shaky just because of who he was in God. And now he comes to Jesse's house to anoint Israel's next king. And Jesse calls all of his sons, all seven of them. But he doesn't call David in. Now, if David is like most of us, you would have seen or heard some ruckus going on at the house. And word probably would have traveled somehow that the prophet's in your house. If I'm a young guy and someone famous comes over to my house and I'm not in the house, I'm trying to get to the house. Are you following me? David didn't do that. David stayed out with his sheep. David did not leave his responsibility to go where there was someone who was popular. He was what? Behaving himself wisely. He heard what was happening. He observed. He looked at those sheep. If I leave them, they're going to get killed. I'm not leaving these sheep. Came to a conclusion, acted on it. He stayed. Not only that, I mentioned to you a little bit earlier, he goes into his home, and the prophet anoints him in front of his entire family. If that doesn't blow your head up, a lot of things may not, but it didn't. And he could have taken a different posture of heart with his own dad, with his brothers, yet we do not read any of that in Scripture. What we do read in Scripture is that when his father sent him out to go carry provisions to his brothers at the war, he gladly took those provisions and obeyed his father's instruction because he behaved wisely, and someone who behaved wisely listened. And when he was asked to go to Saul's house and play his harp for him because Saul was getting oppressed by spirits, even before he left, David made sure that there was somebody to watch his sheep. He wasn't going to leave the sheep alone. He looked and he observed it. I got to go do this, but I can't leave them. Hmm. Got to get somebody who's faithful, who will take care of them, who if a lion or a bear comes... They'll do what I would do. I would fight them and kill them so they couldn't touch my father's sheep. David behaved wisely, friend, before his day of success ever came. My next question is, what was the motivation for David to behave wisely? Has that question occurred to you since we've been talking about this? Anybody? Anybody? What made him, motiv what, what motivated him? If, if you're an employer and, and you, you interview 10 people and there's one who just seems to stand out to you so much more than the other ones, not that the other ones aren't great interviewees, but this one just stands out. What is it about that individual? Why is the question that's on the floor right now? Why did David behave wisely? He was a man after God's own heart, the Bible tells us. If we could open up his heart and look into it from a spiritual perspective, David, what was it that was motivating you, that was keeping you steady, that was making you stable when everybody else was singing songs about you and just, you know, frothing all over you? How did you do that? How did you stay on task? How did you stay mentally focused? How did you stay connected with God? It was this, the fear of the Lord. 
Why did you behave wisely, David? If David were here being interviewed, David would say, he'd say, PK, I behave wisely for this one reason. I fear God. I fear God. It's interesting, Saul was Israel's king. And one of his big problems that he had towards the end of his reign was that he was fearful of the people. As God is raising up David to become king over Israel, one of the, his great strong points of his character is that he fears not the people, he fears God. How do you go out and fight a, a, a nine-foot, nine-inch giant who is a, 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 a champion of war from his youth? You don't, you're not afraid of him. You know why? Because you fear God. David feared the Lord. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. David behaved wisely because he feared God. He was wise because of a heart that was reverential, that was in awe of who God is and what God could do. And David cultivated and maintained an abiding, ongoing relationship with the Lord. So then we have to progress now. If the fear of the Lord what was, was the thing that motivated David's heart to behave wisely, the engine of his behavior, to obtain wisdom, to know how to act, to know when to speak, to know when to be quiet, to know what to do and what not to do, then what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is a reverential awe of who God is. It's expressed through a desire to please him. It's a reverential awe. It's just not being afraid of God like God is going to strike you down with a lightning bolt. It's not that you're so afraid of God that you're immobilized and you can't even serve God nor speak to others about him. It's not that. It's a reverential awe of who he is and this desire to please him. Children have it. Most of us still have it. There are people in your life who you just want to please. If you're a husband, you want to please your wife. If you're a wife, you want to please your husband. If you're children, you want to please your parents and make them proud. You want to please your entire family so there's a sense of pride. You want to bring honor to the family name. And this kind of heart wants to please Almighty God. But if I were to say there's a little bit more we can understand and learn about the fear of the Lord, it would be this. If I had to break it down to its biblical definition and the, probably the most primary thing about it, the fear of the Lord is just simply this, dear friend, is to hate evil. To hate evil. Not like toy with evil and way out, you know, should I have this affair or shouldn't I have this affair? Should I cheat or should I not cheat? Should I go and commit this crime or should I not? You know, they're kind of equal. No, it's not that. The fear of the Lord is to have a violent hatred against evil. <laughs> Let me quote some verses to you, if I may. Job 28, verse 28. And to man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil, that is understanding. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. Proverbs 16, verse 6, in, mirth, in mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Proverbs 14, 16, a wise man fears and departs from evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. Fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Now you may think or say, well, what is evil? Evil is what God says is evil. <laughs> because if God tells us to do something, then the opposite of that is what he does not want us to do. Would you agree with me on that? Yes. 
So therefore, to not do what God says to do would be evil. See, remember the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? God had the exclusive right over that to judge what is good and evil, but we, mankind, stepped in there and we tried to make the call in terms of what we believe is good and evil, and we messed it up. But God knows this is good and this is evil. We don't really know that. And, and the deceitfulness of sin is that you call something good evil and something evil good, and we see it all day long, 24-7 happening. And it's confusing because you go, that is horrible. How could that how could that have occurred? People are happy because something bad happened to a group of people or to a community. How could that be? Why were they rejoicing over that? It's because, friend, of the deceitfulness of sin. Listen very carefully. When God says something is good, it is definitely good. When God says something is bad, it is definitely bad. And from those things, we must stay away from. Psalm 34. Can you go there with me, please? You guys are doing great tonight. Thank you. Psalm 34, verse 11 through 14. Let me give you a little bit of practical application of this point, which is to hate evil. Scripture does this for us. David, the writer, says this. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Practically, how do we apply this? Well, first and foremost, you might need to start right here where David mentions. He says, come and let me teach you. There's different ways to activate the fear of the Lord in one's life. One is you choose to fear the Lord by loving knowledge. Or the fear of the Lord, Scripture says, can even fall on you. Or, like it says here, you can have someone teach you the fear of the Lord. Let someone teach you about the fear of the Lord. Then guard your tongue from speaking evil and deceit, from gossiping about people, from backbiting about people, from berating people. When we have that desire, I think God wants us to pray. When we have that desire to say something about someone, I think what he would rather have us do would be to pray for that person as opposed to talking about them. We have to guard our tongue because this little red rebel in our mouths can say a whole bunch of things and sometimes it just can feel good just to let it rip. <laughs> just let that thing go. Take the emergency brake off and just let it go. Just let it go. But you guard your tongue. You guard your tongue because of reverence for God. You do good. Do good to people. There is evil, and if you depart from evil, that means now I'm going to do something good. That person made me mad. I was going to go and key their car. Now I'm going to buy them a cup of coffee. I'm going to take them a sandwich for lunch. My neighbor makes me mad because they play their loud music at all hours of the night, and I can't get my rest. I was going to storm over there and give them a few choice words, but instead, I'm going to invite them to church and take them to coffee after. Do good. Some of you are sitting out there just thinking, Lord, you really have to help me on this. <laughs> then he says, seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. As Christians, God's calling for us is to be peacemakers, not peace breakers. Peacemakers, make peace. Be a person who, with God in our lives, we can endeavor to make peace. Can I share something really cool with you yes. about, about peace and just how powerful it is? And some, maybe you didn't even consider this when you read, but in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sent his disciples out on a two-week missionary journey, not to the Gentiles, but to the Jewish nation, because that was all they could handle at that point in time. He sent them out, and he said, you know what, whatever house you go into, if they receive you, he said this, let your peace stay in that house. 
That's how powerful the presence of God is with you. Let that peace that abides on you, that has calmed you through life storms, that keeps your heart steady when everything around you is unstable, let that kind of same peace rest in that place. That's how powerful the peace of God is. And God says, seek peace. Go after peace and pursue it. Don't just try one time. Okay, I tried, Lord. I sought peace. It didn't work. Therefore, I quit. No. Seek peace the first time, then pursue it the second, third, fourth. And as much as depends on you, live peaceably with other people. The second thing I want to say to you as it relates to the fear of the Lord, I'm just going to read this and then I'm going to come to a conclusion here is to treat people justly. This is what David did. David treated people justly. You have to consider, he was a young man. He was not formally trained. And now he's over people who are older than him, who are formally trained, who have families. He doesn't have a family at this point in time when he was uh, promoted. He later, you know, got a wife. But the second way that we can express the fear of the Lord is, to, number one, hate evil. Number two, treat people justly. I love these verses we're about to read. I hope you fall in love with them like I have. 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. It will be the last place we turn and go to tonight, verses 1 through 4. For time's sake, allow me please to begin to read. Now, these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just. In ruling how, David? Ruling in the fear of God. David was promoted over men. And that promotion came incrementally into his life until he was sat over Israel as his king. But David had this word from God. If you're going to rule over people, if you're going to rule over men, you've got to be just. And you've got to rule in the fear of the Lord. Colossians 4 verse 1 says, Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. When it speaks of being just, it speaks of being honorable and fair in one's dealings and actions with people, doing things that are morally right. It just it talks about treating people just, being fair with people, treating people right. It's not real, real deep, but it's very, very simple and it's very, very practical. And it's how to behave ourselves wisely when we deal with people. I just want to give you a, a, a practical application of this particular point. Write these verses down, please. Second Chronicles 19, 7 through 9. And Jehoshaphat has said, judges over people. And he's telling them, Essentially, I'm paraphrasing, you can read it on your own time. He's telling them you need to basically lead in the fear of the Lord, but do so faithfully and do so with a loyal heart. Be faithful and do so with a loyal heart. To be faithful means to be conscientious, to have fidelity, steadiness, stability. So when David was leading men, David was not all over the place. He was not all over the map to where people couldn't follow him. They didn't know his decision-making processes. They didn't know his patterns of thinking. He wasn't all over the place. David was very steady. He was faithful. There was fidelity in him. And people were able to grab hold of that stability in him as their new leader. Then he was loyal. The Amplifier says of this part, that he had integrity and he, was blame, he had a blameless heart. Have integrity. Have a blameless heart in dealing with people. So if we're going to review, David behaved himself wisely. He did so because of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to, number one, hate evil, and number two, 
to treat people justly. Could you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? It's an interesting fact about Jesus, who is God's son. The Bible says over in the book of Isaiah, talking about the spirit of the Lord being upon him, it says that part of the manifestation, one of the manifestations and demonstrations of the spirit of God upon Jesus was the fear of the Lord. And it said that Jesus' delight, prophetically speaking, was in the fear of the Lord. Jesus showed mankind what it was like to reverence God and obey his word fully, completely. The first man on planet Earth, his name was Adam. He did not fully obey God at all. And because he didn't, he allowed sin to enter into the world and death through sin. And so all have died. Death came into this world because of sin. And every person on this wonderful planet has been born into this spiritual condition of spiritual death because of sin. And we're separated from God, who is holy and who is just. God loves his creation, humanity, but because he is holy and righteous and just and pure, sin had to be judged. Therefore, God, out of his love, sent his son Jesus from heaven to earth to take the place of all of humanity and pay the wage of sin, which is death. And so Jesus Christ hung on a cross on a hill called Calvary. And there on that cross, he became sin. And then he died. Thus he cried out, it is finished. The work needed to redeem mankind was complete. And three days later, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And he is alive right now. And he sits, he stands in front of you wanting to come into your heart, into your life. But you, my dear friend, are the only one who can let him inside of your heart. Jesus will not bang down the doors of your heart. He will simply knock, and you have the choice to let him in to your life. Can I tell you that it is the single most important decision that any person on planet Earth could ever make? It is the best choice you will ever make because he gave his life so you could live he gave his life so when you do lay down your body in death one day and that day is coming for all of us should the Lord tarry you'll spend eternity with him and with all who have gone before in Christ and you'll be with him forever and ever and ever and throughout all eternity. And Christ has done that for anyone who will come to him and believe in him and accept him as God's gift of eternal life. A gift has to be received. Otherwise, it's not a gift. It's a purchase. He purchased our salvation, our redemption. The ability for us to have a relationship with God, the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, Jesus did that for us. Now we just simply have to receive him as the gift of God. If you're here tonight and you want to invite Jesus into your heart to be your Savior and Lord, I cannot speak enough about him and how important it is for you to trust him with your life, with your eternal salvation, with your soul, because no one whom you know has done what Christ has done, nor is there anyone who could do what he has done for you, because no one was divine like him. If you are backslidden here spiritually, and you understand what I mean when I say that, it's not that you can't 
all of us can stand to grow more and more in the Lord. But you've made a conscious choice to not pursue God, and you've gone back to some of the old life, the old ways, the old things, the old crowd. And that means you are backslidden, my dear friend. You're a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter, and tonight is your night to come back home. God is reaching out to you right now. His love, his compassion is beckoning you to come back to him, to repent and return to your first love. Would you come to him tonight? I'm going to count to three. When I say three, I want you to raise your hand up high by your upraised hand. You're saying, God, I want to invite Jesus into my heart for the very first time, or I want to recommit my life back to him. Here we go. One. Don't let this moment pass you by, friend. Two, people have been praying for you for years because they love you and God loves you. Three, would you raise your hand and respond to Jesus? Would you respond to God? I see a hand there, 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 hands there. Thank you for your hands. Thank you for that hand. See your hand there. Thank you, sir. See your hand, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Anyone else in the upper uh, section there, if you've raised your hand, could you just kind of wave it at me so I can see it if you did? Okay, thank you, ushers, for helping me. Thank you for that. God bless you all. You may put your hands down. We're going to pray right now. I'm going to give you some words to say, and all you have to do is mean it with sincerity from your own heart. Please repeat these words out loud after me as you're not talking to anyone else but God. Say, dear God in heaven, with all of my heart, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, that he gave his life on the cross. He took my place. He became sin for me. And that through his shed blood, all my sins are forgiven. And I believe you raised him from the dead. And he is alive right now. Dear Jesus, I invite you into my life to be my Savior. And I confess you as my Lord. My life is now in your hands. Thank you for making me a new creation. In your name I pray, amen. Congratulations to everyone who prayed tonight.